to bring a Bible this morning. Amen. Then I, I mentioned um, during Sunday school, as my mind was racing all over the planet, um, that I was going to double back on the uh, message series I've been preaching. And um, by the way, I, say, uh, I want to welcome everybody here this morning and those of you that have been coming. We appreciate you coming. We've got some uh, folks that they, they are visitors to me because they said that some of them came last Sunday. And I'm going, no, they didn't because I didn't see them. I looked in that picture for them and then I don't, I don't see them in there. By the way, those, those women there, um, those neck ornaments, they're, they're not the people that stretch their necks out. They're not the ones that do that. Uh, they have completely intact necks, uh, I believe, under there. But um, I don't know what all that designates uh, as each woman there. Some of them were wearing something similar. Some of them are a little bit different. And, um, but anyway, it's just very beautiful attire. And um, that's, that is uh, when we used to talk about what we wear to church, we say, put on your Sunday best. Well, that is their Sunday best. And um, to be honest with you, I'm thankful they were wearing shirts, to be honest with you, because in some of the poor villages that we have uh, given food out to, uh, Facebook kicked the pictures off. And I'm going, why did they do that? Because I, I post the pictures sometimes on Facebook. And it was because I didn't recognize that some of the older women, some of the poor women, uh, were bare. And uh, I, didn't, I just didn't see it in the picture. And, uh, but Facebook's AI did. Um, so anyway, but they just, uh, just very, very poor people. Uh, some of the poorest that you'll find. And all they have is that land. All they have is their tribe and their their place in that tribe and uh, I am told that the pastor of this particular church uh, is a really good guy and I think that's him there uh, in the purple but um, anyway he follows our ministry and um, I just want to say if he's listening this morning I appreciate you and all the good people there of his church and uh, it was it was one of the the best times I think I've spent uh, amongst God's people there and uh, it, really, it really is a blessing. And by the way, with it being 104, 105 there, uh, inside that church, it wasn't. It was down probably, I'd say, in the 90s, somewhere in there, uh, which on any, on any day in Missouri, that would be a hot day. But for there, it's cool. Cooler in there than it was outside, definitely. So they did a good job building that church. All right. Exodus chapter 16, if you would turn there. And uh, like I say, this is, um, uh, I think God is leading us to go to the promised land. Amen. Uh, and let me explain that and just sort of the theme um, that I have in mind as I, as I approach this teaching. We all, I mean, we all know that Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, led them into the promised land 40, some 40 years later, uh, close to 41 actually. But they spent 40 years because of their unwillingness to trust God. Their unwillingness to believe Him and believe in what He said. And um, those of you who know me, you know that everything I preach and everything I stand for has to do with the Bible. And you say, well, that's no big deal. That, but believe it or not, there is a, there is a mass exodus, but not in a good way, of churches leaving not only the fundamental teachings of what we believe and the faith that we have of what makes us Christian, but leaving the very source of that faith, and that is the Word of God. They're leaving the Bible, and they're not teaching out of it. They're not preaching out of it. They would rather hear what some other man said. They would rather follow. They would rather read man's books from from the Christian bookstores or from uh, the YouTube or the Facebook or whatever it is, they would rather read that. And I've been there. I've been in that position where if you handed me a book on prophecy 
I'd skip over all the Bible verses and read the text of what the author said. Because I would say to myself, I already, I already know what the Bible says. That's no big deal. And I, how stupid I was. How ignorant I was doing that and, I, and, and being that way and pretending that I'm some super preacher somewhere. Okay? So anyway, uh, God finally changed my heart one day and made me I just fall in love with the Bible. And anytime I got a book to read or something like that, first thing I went to is the scriptures that they wrote in there. I wanted to see what they say the Bible says. And if they're going to alter the Bible or cast doubt upon it or change it in some other way, I'm not interested in reading what they got to say. I don't care what they have to say. I don't care how smart they are. I don't care how many letters they got behind their name. I don't care about any of that stuff. I want to hear. I need to hear from God. If I want to hear from man, I'll turn on... YouTube and watch fail videos of people falling off their skateboards. And I'll just laugh and say, oh, they're so stupid. But anyway, if I want to hear from man, I'll go to hear from man. If I, but I need to hear from God. And so this is where we're going this morning. So I tell you, turn to the 66th chapter of the Old Testament, and that is Exodus 16. And why the 66th chapter? Well, the Bible has 66 books in it. Isaiah is a uh, we call it a microcosm of the Bible. It is a, it's like looking through a condensed version of the Bible in that Isaiah has 66 chapters in it. That is not by accident. By the way, the book of, um, of Lamentations, no, not, yeah, Lamentations is also divided up in a similar fashion in that you have um, in chapters 1, 2, Let's see, one, two, uh, how many chapters have it has in it? Five? In the first, yeah, first two chapters, you have uh, 22 verses that correspond with the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. In the third chapter, the middle chapter, it has 66 verses. In the fourth and fifth chapters, it's back down to 22 again. But, and I, I know I'm reeling off a bunch of numbers, and you're going, well, what is he getting to? What I'm trying to tell you is, is that God has left little glimpses of pictures of his word for us in these days so that we can be confident that what we're reading is without a doubt the absolute verified verily verily i say unto thee thus saith the lord it is the word of god and it matters amen it counts amen god will hold you accountable to how you treated his word in your life all right so he says now, watch this. He's going to give us a picture of the Bible in this particular chapter. In X, and by the way, you're going to see the same thing. If, you're, if you can figure it out before I get there, the 66th chapter of the New Testament has the same imagery in it, same thing in it as does this one. This one says in verse 4, Then, then said the Lord unto Moses, now this is God talking. He says, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. What was that bread? We, we know that part. We know it was called manna. And the word manna means what is it? That it literally means what is it? They did not know what it is. Actually, here's how Jesus put it. They didn't know who it was. They didn't know who it was. That bread, Jesus said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. That's me. That was a glimpse and a picture of me. I am the word of God. So he said, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. Now I'm going to stop right here, and I'm going to preach this for a while. I may, I don't know if I'll get to the end at the right time. We'll see. Whose responsibility is it to go out and gather manna up so that you have something to eat that day. Whose responsibility was it? Was it Moses? Did God say, Moses, now you go out and you get out everything that everybody... Moses is not your waiter. Neither is the Holy Ghost. He said, you, the people, not the clergy, not the preachers, not the prophets, the people are to go out and gather a certain rate every day 
that I may prove them. And let me tell you, God is proving and testing you right this minute as to your ideas about the Word of God, how you treat the Word of God, how you see the Bible as having a particular place in your life. Is the Bible, it, as far as your mind is concerned and your heart concerned, there by the wayside somewhere that every now and then, if you happen to pass by it and it happens to just fall open, you might read it every now and then, or you might see a verse that somebody posted on Facebook and say, oh, that's a good verse. Or you have somebody like I have, I've got a couple guys that send me Bible verses every day, and uh, it's just a verse, usually just one verse out of the Word of God. But how, how, do you, how does the Bible fit into your everyday life? Are you someone who takes it seriously and says, you know what, this is the Word of God. And I know that if, I, if my body gets hungry, then I need to eat food. And I need to do it every day. If my soul gets hungry, what does my soul have to eat? You can either go out and eat the garbage that is out in this world. And let me tell you something. Uh, I appreciate what Chris said about everybody needs a good dose of, of Africa. Uh, a couple years ago, we were in Megori, Kenya. And when I got up every morning to take a shower, there, there, there was a window that was about this high for me in that, in that bathroom. And before I'd take my shower or take my clothes off or anything like that, I'd stand and look out that window because out that window there was some apartments there. and just It was everyday life for these people that lived in Megori Town, Kenya. And right out next to this hotel we were staying in was a big garbage pile that was like in an alleyway. And it, usually it had little smoke coming out of it every day. People would take their trash there and just drop it. And some guy would light it and try to burn the trash down. Usually, every day when I looked out that window, I would see a goat or two filtering through that stuff. And I would tell you something, the difference, when Jesus separated the sheep from the goats, he knew exactly what he was doing. Goats eat garbage. Goats eat garbage. Goats didn't go to heaven. The sheep, they don't eat, they don't eat what goats eat. They can be starving to death. They're not going to eat garbage. Sheep are for pastures. They are for grass. They are for seed. They are for the grain. They are for the Word of God. The seed of the Word of God. Amen. That's what they're for. But anyway, something that touched my heart every day was that after the goats got done picking it through, then the children would come. And... That will open your eyes up to stand and watch children. In some cases, Muslim children. Because they had a couple of mosques in this town. To watch them sort through that garbage to find something to eat. America has it all. Those people have none of it. And I'm not a communist. I'm not a socialist. I'm not saying I'm going to start taking... I think we ought to start taking out everybody's paycheck and sent, I don't believe in that. But I believe when your heart gets opened up to somebody else's need, you'll give. You'll do it. But that, that'll open your eyes up. It really will. It'll make, it, it'll make you glad for what you have. Makes me ask, how come, how come me, Lord? How come me? Why did I get born in America? I've asked that question a hundred times. Why did I get born in America? I could have been born in Kenya. I could have been born in Somalia, China, anywhere. And never hear the word of God. But I was born in America. I can't apologize for that. But I'm not ashamed of it. I was brought up by a mother who read the Bible and taught her children to come to church and read the Word of God. So God says, you gather this, you, the people, gather this rate every day to prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. You see, the, uh, you don't have anything to prove to me. 
you don't. You don't have to tell me how spiritual you are. You don't have to tell me how many times a day you read your Bible. You don't have to tell me how many chapters you read. You don't have to tell me how many times you came to church last month. You don't have to tell me whether you came at all when I was gone. You don't have to tell me that. You don't have anything to show me. It's not a contest between us. Paul says, I'm running the race. But in this race, it doesn't matter who shows up first. What matters is that we show up. That's what matters, okay? I don't care who comes in last. I almost guarantee you, if it's leaped up to me, you see me dragging up the rear, okay? Guarantee you. But God's going to prove it to you. He's going to open your eyes and say, you know, you call yourself some big Christian, some big so-and-so, but how, many, how much of the Bible did you read? Now, this is God asking you this. And with God... He deserves an answer. With God, he's going to confront you about it. And with God, he is going to judge you about it. And it shall come to pass that on the sixth day, they shall prepare that which they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. Now, why on the sixth day? Well, we know the answer to that. The seventh, the seventh day was the Sabbath day. They were not to do any gathering. They were not to do any, what the Bible calls servile labor. That means any, any type of labor that you would be involved in as a servant, and that doesn't mean slave. A servant could be a paid servant. Okay, A servant could be, it'd be like if I, if I took our money, Lisa and I, and we hired us a maid and a butler for our double-wide trailer. Okay? It's got an addition on the back. It's got two more rooms. So we hired us a maid, a maid and a butler. Oh, well, I'm going to pay them. It ain't like I got slaves, you know, they're servants. But that's what servile labor, that's, what, that's the labor you're not supposed to do on the Sabbath day. You're not supposed to do your daily work. Now, cows still need to be milked. God understands that. And he says, the Sabbath's not made for man, but, or excuse me, the sa man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. God gave it to you as a blessing. He says, rest, okay? But anyway, you have to gather in. You're responsible on the sixth day to gather twice as much because if you don't, if you get lazy on God and don't gather in on the sixth day, you're going to starve to death on the seventh day. You're, you won't starve to death, but you're going to starve on the seventh day. And nobody can feed you. Nobody can help you out. Nobody can do that. And that's a beautiful illustration. Nobody can do this for you. You have to want to do it yourself. And listen to me, those of you, let's, let's pray before I say any more. Father, I ask God your blessings upon this word. Lord, I don't know, Lord, already where you're going to take this, but I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just lead us and guide us. Uh, Lord, with your gentle hand and the light that comes to us from the scriptures, Lord, that you would show us great and mighty things which we know not. And teach us, Lord, those things and apply them to our heart. Use them in us, Father. We have, we have a promised land to get to. And Lord, we don't know if we're going to make it. So Lord, would you help us today? We ask your blessings on this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now I didn't forget what I was fixing to say, but anyway, he's testing you on the sixth day to see if you are going to gather in as much. And I remember now what I was saying. Nobody can do this for you. On that seventh day, when you realize that you didn't gather in for the Sabbath day, and you get hungry because lunchtime's coming, and you see your neighbors over there eating, they got, they've got sheep, they've got lamb, they've got beef, they've got bread from the manna, and boy, they're just having them a good time over there, and you don't have anything to eat. You can't go over to your neighbor's house and say, now, gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give you're supposed to give me. I mean, that Jesus tells us to give. He tells us to give to the poor. Well, give me. Uh, listen, you're not poor because you can't do anything. You're poor because you don't want to do anything. That's on you. You can't go to your neighbor on the Sabbath day and get manna from them because they only have enough for themselves. Do you remember the story of the ten virgins that were preparing themselves for the bridegroom and they all had lamps, and they had trimmed them, and the five wise virgins 
made them ready by pouring oil into the lamps. The five foolish virgins did none of that. They, I mean, they prepared the lamp, but they didn't get any oil. When the call comes out that the bridegroom is coming, get ready. The five wise virgins all rise up. They've got plenty of oil in their lamps. They're ready to go meet the bridegroom. The five foolish ones go to the wise ones and say, give us of your oil so, because we don't have any. And the five, listen to me, God is not a socialist. Jesus is the one who taught this parable. And Jesus himself said that the five wise virgins said to the foolish ones, you go into town and buy for yourself the oil that you need. If we give you our oil, there will not be enough for all of us. Do you not understand? Socialism does not work. Or it does work until all the money runs out. And when everybody goes on the government paycheck and nobody's working and bringing in more income, it doesn't work. And God teaches against it. And it's the same idea in your spiritual life proven by this passage right here. Seeing that, and by the way, the number of words that I have underlined up there are 66 words exactly. That's exactly what Jesus, or excuse me, God said to Moses. 66 words in the 66th chapter of the Bible and is teaching you about manna, which is the word of God. Now, let me show you the living word of God. If you turn to Luke 22, that's the 66th chapter of the New Testament. You ought to turn your Bible there and mark that down. And you know what Luke 22 is about? Passover. And bread. Isn't that something? 66th chapter of the New Testament, 66th chapter of the Old Testament, both speak of bread. And Jesus tells us what that bread is. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Now, I want you to listen to this, people. This is where my heart is today. Okay? I got a big smile on my face because I know where I'm going next. Okay? But the bread was manna in the Old Testament. And what it was, uh, the book of Psalms calls manna the corn of heaven. I've never seen that verse until yesterday. I was looking at it yesterday going, oh, that's a neat way to put it, the corn of heaven. And literally what it was was a seed, probably about the size of a corn seed or whatever. But with any seed like wheat or barley or corn or even rice, they could, once they removed the chaff off of it, they could pulverize it like you, like you would use a, a, a mortar and pestle to do it or you used a, a, an ox pulled mill, you had a literal millstone with a round stone just turning around, pressing that wheat or pressing that corn into flour. What you now, what you now have now is this flour, you add a little water to it or whatever you want to do and add something to it you, to leaven it. Maybe if you wanted to, you could make bread out of that or you could make cookies out of it. You make whatever you want, make cakes, make whatever you want. But it all started with the manna. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them saying, this is my body. Now he means exactly what he says. I want to show you something in a minute that God showed me. Because I, as I taught the pastors in Samburu and I taught the pastors in Turkana, pretty much the same thing. This is what God led me to, was teaching them wondrous things out of God's word. I wanted those men to have a, a, a new love and a new respect and a, maybe even a new understanding for the Word of God so that they would love it, they would cherish it, they would read it, they, because it will keep their ministry and their church in line with what God says. Because just like in America, it's easy to be led astray by wolves in sheep's clothing. Say amen. It is easy for us to follow them because the clothing is starting to get more realistic. It's starting to get scary out there. The way people are so easily led into false doctrines. 
Well, the wolves are the one who has taken them out of the sheepfold and they're taking them away from the body of Christ and thus they're taking them away from Christ himself because Christ is going to stay with his body. Somebody say amen to that. Now, watch this. This was the candlestick or what they call the menorah. Uh, it was the lamp inside of the tabernacle. Again, I've, I've taught this before, but if you remember, God is the one who dictated to Moses the exact uh, decorations that he wanted on this. It looks like a seven branch tree and it's supposed to look like an almond tree. And it, it was filled with oil. This was the only, listen to this now, this was the only light allowed in the house of God. Do you get that? Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You will not have. You will not hear me break out my uh, my Bible and then my my uh, Joel Osteen book and say, "Oh, look, page forty-eight. Joel Osteen says something really good. I like it. Boy, let me give you what Joel said. Let me tell you what Joel taught us. Let me let me read from Joyce Meyer's new. Boy, she got a new book out. Have you seen it? Boy, it says. In fact, jo uh, Joyce teaches you to love yourself. You think I'm making that up? She, she wrote a book and she did a series of teachings on it and she said that she, here's how she did it. She said that the Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the key to that is learning to love yourself. No, the problem is you love yourself too much. That's your problem. Is that you love yourself way too much. You put yourself on a pedestal and people like her are there easy to teach it to you so that she can take from you what you're going to, what you're going to give her for it. She's a con artist just like everybody else is. Okay? And I'm just telling you, stay away from her. You'll not hear me. Here, I just gave you her teachings. You'll not hear me teach Joyce Meyer in the church. I'm the, listen, I'm telling you, God only wants one source of light in your life, and that is the Word of God. So notice he said three bowls, like unto almonds, with a knop or a knob. You've seen a knob on a tree limb and a flower in one branch. And he said, so a bowl, a knob, and a flower. And you put three on each candle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, on the one candle on the outside, there's nine different decorations. Three sets of three. Second candle, same thing. Third candle, same thing. Outside, the outside candle, nine of them. The middle one here, uh, nine. The one here on the right, nine decorations. The one in the middle now is different. And I found out why, John. The one in the middle is different. This is what I'm preaching this morning. One, two, three, four sets not three and God specifically told him I want four in the middle and why did he say that well I think I'll show it so it's 39 on one side 27 on the other or 27 on the outer branches 12 in the middle but it gives you a total of the number of books in the Bible 39 in the Old Testament 27 in the New Testament 66 all together and here, and I'm telling you, God is telling you, here's the light right here. In the 66 books of this Bible, that's the light that you're to follow. It's the only light. I'm not the light. John the Baptist wasn't the light. We're, we're, we have to be as ministers careful to say that. I'm giving you the light. I'm pointing you in the direction where the light is, but I'm not the light. This is the only light allowed in the house of God. And you, my friend, if you say, I'm a Christian, I know I'm born again, then you are the house of God. Which means that this has a direct application to your life. Now, I, I said this during Sunday school. It, like I say, it used to be a real struggle for me to read the Bible. Even as a minister, read the Bible, read the Bible. Boy, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand. I don't like it. I don't, whatever. I was the worst student, I thought, in school because I hated studying. Well, that's what you do in school. You study. 
And well, as a minister, you study. Paul said, study to show thyself approved unto God. And so here again, the study part, he's proving you. He's not proving me, he's proving you. So, now watch this. Turn to Revelation 1. And this, this one, of the, one of the pastors, I can't remember if it was in Samburu or Turkana, but I, I had them all stand there at the last, I was done, and I said, did you, did you men learn anything today? Amen. And one man took his Bible like this, and he said, 66. Now, I don't know if he learned that word from me or knew how to say it in English, but he said it right, 66, because that's what I taught him. And they were just like, amen, wow, amen. So we had, we had a good time out there. Now watch this. This is what God added to what that, what that pastor said. He said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me. This is John. And he hears a voice behind him as of a trumpet. He's exiled on the Isle of Patmos. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. What did he see? That. Okay. I saw seven golden candlesticks. Boom. That's what he saw. And in the midst, see that word? Midst, what does it mean? The middle. Okay? Dave, you know I'm on the level because my bubble's in the middle. Amen? I wasn't talking to you, Megan. <laughs> in the midst. Of the seven candlesticks. See where the midst is? Hang on. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the... By the way, this is the 66th book of the Bible, obviously. Clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. And his head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow. What does uh, Isaiah 1 say? Uh, come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And on Christ's head was laid all the sins of mankind. When they put that crown of thorns upon his head, that signified thorns were the curse that God gave Adam, the man, for his sins, for his transgression. And they crowned Christ with that crown of thorns. So he is bearing our sins on his head and he took them all the way to the cross. And they left when he left. Amen. And they're gone. You know why? Because they're buried. Buried in the deepest sea. Yes, that's good enough for me. I shall live eternally. Praise God. My sins are gone. Amen. Uh his head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, and as if they burned in a furnace. Hey, we're seeing, studying that in Sunday school, aren't we? Look ye there. Uh, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. What is that? That is the Word of God. Or the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So he has a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. This is Jesus Christ, doubt it not. And here's the, here's the imagery that I'm getting from this, and as I thought about this. Here we have the, the seven golden candlesticks, okay? There they are in their pure form. There they are. They, the seven represents the Holy Spirit. We're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And that there are seven spirits of God, and there are seven seal, there are seven candles here. There are seven seals on the book in God's right hand, and so on and so on. So the number seven represents the Holy Spirit here, and it shows that it's perfect and it's complete. There's nothing God, God it does not have in the New Testament written anywhere that once we find the candlestick uh, in with the other temple treasures, we start adding almonds to it. He does not tell us that. Amen. You, you leave it the way you found it, intact, 66 books. Read them, amen. 
It's, it's, your problem is that it, it's not that there needs to be more added to the Bible. That's not your problem. Your problem is you need to read what you got. Amen. Now, uh, so think of this now as a, as a picture of your Bible. And Christ said, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I, where? In the midst of them. So here we are gathered here in this place, and I believe Jesus Christ is here, amen? In fact, I know he is, because I'm holding him in my hand right here. That which we have handled of the word of life, that John said in John chapter 1, or 1 John chapter 1. So as I thought about that, and Jesus being in the midst of those seven candlesticks, I thought, that's it. From Genesis to Revelation, Jesus literally is in every page, every chapter, every book, every story in the Bible, every prophecy in the Bible, every psalm that is written, everything, all the wisdom given to us in Proverbs, the warnings given to us by the prophets, all of them are written uh, about Jesus, the Son of God, who is the Word of God. Amen? Uh, and I, I, I dealt with a guy one time. He, in fact, I was going to deal with him again, too. Uh, he says that he lived uh, as a Christian. Now, born again, he lived for years as a Christian, but never heard from God. Never, ne God never said anything to him or God, never heard anything from God. And I'm going, well, you don't believe the Bible then. You don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. You don't believe that the Bible literally is the words that God spoke. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You don't believe that. So you're out there wandering in the wilderness. You're going to find some other thing that's going to try to satisfy you. But I'm here to tell you that nothing will satisfy your soul like the reading of this old King James Bible right here. Nothing, there's nothing in this world greater than the Word of God. And I'm telling you that Jesus is, in fact, Jesus is in the creation. He, in fact, He's the Creator. John chapter 1 tells us that all things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. He is the Adam. He is the second Adam that comes to us in the New Testament. The first Adam comes in the Old. Um, uh, he is Abraham. He is Isaac. He is Jacob. He is the 12 tribes. He is in the midst of his people, Israel. He literally is from page to page, from cover to cover. Jesus Christ is right here in the word of God. Somebody say amen. I got a better one for you. Hang on. Ran out of water on that one. He said it was in the midst of the seven candlesticks. Well, that's interesting. Because it's an odd number. Seven's an odd number. That means you got an even number on one side, an even number on the other. You got the, you got the odd guy in the middle. And uh, that middle candlestick is different. It's got 12 decorations or four sets instead of three. So, the midst. Notice the four decorations. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The four Gospels where the Word, in fact, the fourth Gospel says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh. Amen? So literally, in the midst of of these candlesticks in the four Gospels, there's Jesus right there. That, in fact, that's where he shows up. And that's where he's taught to be the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Word of God, the Word of Life, the Giver of Salvation, the, the Source of the Spirit of God. He breathed on his disciples. He said, Receive ye the Spirit. And they did. And upon them, then, was written the Word of God. Now... Let's take this. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, that's cold, too. I like that. Turn to Deuteronomy 18. Look at here. Look at here. Look at here. Now, the point of this message series is to help you get to the promised land. Okay? So, number one, to anybody who's listening to me and you're lost... 
Now, I can't say that you're lost. I'm not your judge. I'm not saying you are either, but I'm not saying that you're saved either. It's not my place. I'd get it wrong, and I don't want to do that. So number one, if you're not born again, then the promised land for you is finding Christ in an acceptable time. And now is the acceptable time. Finding Christ when he's available to you instead of waiting to a time maybe when he won't be there anymore. That's what gets me. Is since I don't know the day of my death, I figured I better get right with God while I can because I won't get another chance. Life is your chance. While you're living, that's your chance to get right. Amen? So the point of this is to help you get to the promised land. Get you out of bondage first. And then get you into the promised land. I've also been teaching it in the way of those who have addic addictions. Whether it's drugs, street drugs, or uh, various uh, pharma drugs. You get addicted to those just as well. Ask me about it. Okay? And, uh, boy, that's, that's a bad way to go. It's a bad way to go. I'm telling you. But God will deliver you. He can. I'm telling you, He can. So maybe, maybe you need to be delivered. Okay? Then the promised land for you is being sober. Being sober, being clean, that's the promised land. And there's a lot of things that's going to get in your way to try to get you back into Egypt. Egypt is where the drugs are, it's where the alcohol is, it's where the pornography is, it's where the adultery is, it's where the... Um, you know, some people, some people are addicted to power. They have got to be the boss in everything. And that's just, that's just as wicked as any of the others is. Bless God, I don't do that. I'm the only one worthy in this church to do anything. I actually had a man say that to Brother Sterling while I was in Kenya. I guess I'm the only one worthy to preach for Pastor Mike while he's gone. So, and Sterling said, nah. <laughs> Thank you, Sterling. Or... Let's say you are born again, you're saved, you know you are, but there's some issues of life. There's always going to be something where you need help in. You're lacking in it as far as your walk with God, as far as your relationships are concerned with other people, your marriage, or your raising children, or whatever. I mean, there could be dozens of them. All of these are important to God. And he says, I'll give you, I'm here to give you abundant life. Okay? And well, he means that. I believe that there is suffering that takes place for the children of God. But I also believe that God can give us a pretty good life. And you know what? You know, the last three weeks, it was, it was hard on us. It was work. But I tell you what, it's better than going to hell. Amen, Chris? Amen? Well, I won't ask Michael. No, he's... It's better than going to hell. Amen? So I'll, I'll take the hardships of life along with everything else as long as I get to go to heaven and be with Jesus for all of eternity. Amen? It's all I care about. It's all I want. So in Deuteronomy 18, watch this now. and I'm, I know I've got to close here in a minute. And I'll, I'll continue this on next Sunday because i got a lot to say on this. This is... I mean, this is beautiful. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet. Notice, notice what this book is. It is a sure word of what? Prophecy. The whole thing is, thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith the word of God. Amen. So I will raise up unto thee a prophet. Now it's capitalized P, so we know it's Christ. From where? From the midst of thee. What did Jesus say to the uh, the woman at the well, from the midst of there, from, from out of out of your, uh, I can't remember what he said, but 
Out of, out of you shall come forth springs of living water. Amen. And God will just, he'll just bring the, what, he'll bring the word of God out of you. He will cause it to, to uh, bring forth uh, fruit and manifest fruit in your life. Once it's planted there, once it's put there, God is the one who's going to raise that thing up and manifest it in your life. And now you find yourself in the promised land where you wanted to be. Amen. And he said, Of thy brethren like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. That word has the word hear in it. So you know what it means. You hearken what you hear. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, uh, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. You know what happened when they got that this wasn't in the movie that you saw, the Ten Commandments, with Charlton Heston. But when they gathered around Mount Sinai and God began to speak to them, they said, Whoa, 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 whoa. It scared them. It, read Exodus 20. After God spoke the Ten Commandments to them, they got scared. And they said, Moses, tell God, don't do that no more. From now on, Moses, you go up to that mountain all you need to and hear from God and just listen to everything he says. You come back and tell us what he said. We'll believe you. But tell God, don't say those things anymore. It struck terror and fear in them. And I want to tell you something. If you are not right with God, I hope it does strike terror and fear inside of you. I hope you get to shaking so bad that you can't stand it. You, you'll be nervous. You'll be pacing the floor in the middle of the night. Be crying. Why are you crying? I don't know why. I'm just afraid I'm going to hell. I've had people say that. What's the matter with you? I don't know. I'm just afraid I'm going to hell. And I don't want to go to hell when I die. I don't want to spend eternity down there. And I'm afraid because of what I've done. And God knows what I've done. Maybe, it, maybe I've gone too far. Well, listen, let me tell you the good news. If you're up pacing in the middle of the night crying, worried about if you've gone too far, you haven't. That means God's still dealing with you. And you've got the, one of the spirits of God in you, which is called the fear of the Lord. And you say, you know, I know God has a right to throw me in jail. I know God has a right to send me to, send me to hell for all of eternity. I know he has the right, but I don't want that God. Is there any mercy for me? I'm here to tell you there is. Amen. And the Lord said unto me, they have well spoken that which they have spoken, and I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee. And look at what he said after that. Maybe I'm wrong about this whole message, but I don't think so. And we'll put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. I, I just think that in the pages of this dear book, God has put the words from his mouth into this book. I don't believe this book contains the Word of God. I believe that it is the Word of God. What's the difference? Containing means that maybe some of, the, some of it's left out. It's got good parts in it which probably are the words of God. By the way, that's what a lot of the Bible translators said about the NIV, the one that they translated. They said, maybe this isn't all that God said. But we think that some of the things in here might be the word of God. That doesn't do it for me. I got to know. It'd be like if Gary went out to buy a car and the car salesman. Now, Gary's not going to buy a new one. He's going to buy a used one. In fact, I'm going to buy a used one next one because the new ones are just too expensive. I wish they'd bring the Yugo back. Amen? Buy me a $4,000 automobile. But Gary's going to go out and buy a car, and he goes to a car salesman. He's never known him before, doesn't know him, doesn't know if he can trust him or not. And the guy tells him, Gary says, well, I like this car here. And the, the, he, Gary says, does it run? And the salesman says, well, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it, it, the, guy, the guy drove it in here. That's all I can say for it. 
That's about as good as a preacher telling you, well, I don't think the Bible has all of the Word of God. That's not good enough for me. You want me to drive off with this car, I got to know it's going to make it down the first block and at least get me home so I can call the police and try to have them stop me before I get back to your office or something like that. Now, I've given a lot to you. I'm going to, I'm going to let you go here in a minute. I appreciate you coming. Boy, it's good to be back. Amen. But I just, that, that was on my heart to share with the pastors. Is to get, them, get them to fall in love with the Bible again. Get them to read it again. To study it. To meditate on it. Think about it. And my prayer for you this week is that God will aggravate you to death with Bible verses. That he will not leave you alone. He'll pester you and he'll buzz past your ear like a mosquito or a fly. And you'll just be, stop it! I can't take no more! God says, oh yeah, you can. And that God just won't let you alone until you're down on your knees somewhere or you're sitting in your truck or you're sitting on your couch, tears falling down your face, and you're saying, this is the Word of God. These words, that's what Peter said, isn't it? When Jesus said, will you also leave me? Peter said, to whom shall we go? Ye have the words of eternal life. He wasn't saying it mockingly. He was saying, we have no other place to go. This is the Word of God. Amen? Let's bow our heads. I really do. I appreciate you coming this morning. I appreciate you. It's a welcome back for me, and I appreciate that. It made us feel like we come home, and uh, I sure did miss everybody. And glad to be back. I would go again to Kenya when God allows. And uh, just realizing that's just, that's just part of our flock. That's part of us. All of those wonderful people out there. And I want you to have the same that I give unto them, which is... Love the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Believe the Word of God. Lean on the Word of God. Meditate. That means think about it while you're going to work or while you're coming back or while you're doing your work. Or all of a sudden, you'll be thinking about something daydreaming and all of a sudden, a Bible verse will pop in your head and God will show you something that you never, ever saw before or never thought of before and hair stands up on the back of your neck and... It just gives you the willies for a minute. And you think, wow, where did that come from? Well, that came from the Holy Ghost. It came from the Word of God. And God will say to you, there's a lot more like that in this wonderful book. If you'll read it and believe it, I'll teach it to you. Father, I pray this morning, Lord, for these people. I thank you, God, for the, the welcome back. Uh, from, from my family and from my brothers and sisters here at Bethel. Lord, I'm very, very thankful, God, that you have united us all together in love. And Lord, the fellowship is sweet, and I pray, dear God, you would continue to bless it. I know the devil hates it. He does not like a church that's getting along, and so he is always going to try to find a way to mess it up. And Father, I, I know it'll happen. And Father, I pray, dear God, that you'll just help us to get through it, Lord, like you always have. Father, be with Paige and be with her family as they say goodbye uh, to their daughter. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would just minister to them in a mighty way. And let them know, God, that you have not left them, you have not forsaken them. You're right there with them. 
And though, Lord, we do not understand when, it, when a child dies, we don't understand it. But, Father, Lord, give us grace to trust in you and to lean upon you and say, God, I don't understand, but I know that you always have a good reason in what you do. So, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would bless this family. Bless all of those, Lord, who've heard your word this morning, that we may fall in love with our Bible all over again and see that it really does have Jesus in it from page to page. He is Moses. He is the rock that Moses struck. He's the water that flowed from that rock. He is the bread from heaven that was gathered up every day that fed his people. He is David, the singer. He's Isaiah, the, the preaching prophet. He's Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. He's John the Baptist preparing the way. He's the son of man. He's the son of God. He is the word of God. And I pray, Heavenly Father, Lord, that you would strengthen our relationship with our Savior by way of the words that he has given us from this book. We ask this in Jesus' name. All of God's people said, stand to your feet this morning. Hey, man, come back, be with us, 3 o'clock this afternoon. You are dis